So we consider the black-footed ferret one of North America's most endangered mammals, and we consider them the masked bandits of the prairie, as they are known for the black mask across their face. We know today there are fewer than 400 in the wild. The primary threats to their survival today include a non-native disease called sabbatic plague and a lack of prey dog habitat in which they can occupy. Welcome to Nature Breaking, a World Wildlife Fund podcast focused on the news and trends affecting our natural world and the people and species who call it home. I'm Seth Larson, and today I'm welcoming two experts to tell us about one of the most endangered mammals in North America, black-footed ferrets. These animals live in the prairies of the northern Great Plains, and unfortunately only about 390 of them remain in the wild today. But that's actually up significantly from decades past when they were once believed to be extinct. But big threats remain in the form of habitat loss and a non-native disease called sylvatic plague, which affects the ferrets as well as prairie dogs. The ongoing effort to save black-footed ferrets has brought together experts from WWF, local conservation agencies in Montana, and students from the Ani and Nakota tribes. It's a really inspiring story of partnership and determination, and joining us today to talk about it are Christy Bly, WWF's Black-Footed Ferrets Restoration Manager, and Tevin Messerly, a biologist with the Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife Department. Christy and Tevin have been engaging in the hands-on work of saving black-footed ferrets for years, and I think you'll really enjoy hearing from them. As always, please be sure to subscribe to this show and rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you prefer to hear or see us. And now, here's my conversation with Christy and Tevin. Okay, I'm joined now by Christy Bly, WWF's Black-Footed Ferrets Restoration Manager, and Tevin Messerly, a biologist with the Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife Department. Welcome both of you to Nature Breaking. So, Christy, I'm going to start with you, and, you know, I gave a very short description of black-footed ferrets in my intro, but I'd love for you to spend a couple minutes on the basic info about this species that I think not everyone knows a lot about. So, what are black-footed ferrets' lives like? Why do they need our help to survive? And what about them inspired you to focus on their conservation? Well, thank you, Seth. It's great to be here. So, we consider the black-footed ferret one of North America's most endangered mammals. They are the only black-footed ferret species native to North America, and we consider them the masked bandits of the prairie, as they are known for the black mask across their face. I love that nickname. They are obligates of prairie dogs, and so their historical and current range overlaps with prairie dog species from Canada to Mexico, the Rocky Mountain Front to the Missouri River, and they are mostly a solitary species except for breeding. And they come together once a year where the mom then raises kits um, up until they disperse from their natal den site in the fall. We know today there are fewer than 400 in the wild. The primary threats to their survival today include a non-native disease called sabbatic plague and a lack of prey dog habitat in which they can occupy. Ferrets require large expanses of prey dogs for survival. Prey dog burrows provide food and shelter and the ability to raise young. As on the grassland ecosystem, all shelter is mostly found underground. Yeah, and I think you maybe said this already, but they're, they're nocturnal, right? So they, they live their lives at night and we don't really see much of them during the day, right? Exactly. They are an elusive species. Uh, like you said, they're active only at night. And so they um, come above ground in the evenings when they are looking to hunt prairie dogs who are sleeping below ground very innocently. <laughs> yeah, how convenient. Um, Tevin, I have a simple, similar question for you. I wanted to just ask what about, uh, what about black-footed ferrets inspired you to spend so much of your time devoted to their conservation? Well, for one, they're... Um part of our conservation, five-year conservation plan. And they're just an interesting uh, species to work with, especially the work at uh, spotlighting at night. That's, uh, it's tough, but I mean, actually seeing these uh, individual animals and uh, it's just something special. Yeah, I wanna, in a, in a couple minutes, I'm gonna ask you to, to really walk us through what the experience is like of actually identifying 
the ferrets at night and finding them in the mm-hmm. wild to to help uh, advance their conservation. I I I want to I want you to walk us through what a, an average night looks like on that front. But we'll get there in a second because I want to just cover a little bit more of the background about these these animals before we we get to what we're doing to save them. And you know, one follow up question I had for you, Tevin, is I know my understanding is the Ani and Nakoda tribes have a special connection with black-footed ferrets. I, I, I understand you're a, a member of the Nakoda tribe, right? And um, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about the spiritual connection between those tribes and these animals, if you can. So when we have uh, dancers, they'll have uh, in the past adorned uh, black fur fairy pelts on their braids when they danced. And uh, so when uh, someone possesses those pelts and they, uh, you know, pass, they'll be buried with those pelts. So they're, they're sacred. It's my understanding too, Tevin, that the black fur fairy, among many other prairie wildlife, are considered animal relatives to the tribes of Fort Belknap. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. So what's cool, Seth, is that the return of this species to Ani and Nakota homelands in northern Montana has been able to bring this animal relative back and therefore the connections that the tribes historically had and now today currently share with the Blackfoot Ferret. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I think we heard a similar story. Uh, we did a few, an episode last year about bison conservation in, um, in the Dakotas and... Um, heard a similar story about the importance of reuniting the tribes there with um with their animal relatives in in the, in the form of the bison and I, I know it was a similarly meaningful experience um so christy you hinted at this a moment ago but i do want to talk a little more about the big ongoing threat that still faces black-footed ferret populations today which is sylvatic plague and you know it affects black-footed ferrets it affects prairie dogs which are the the main prey of the ferrets. So it has this dual threat of it kills the ferrets and it also um, kills their primary food source. So I wanted to ask you to give us some more background on this and just tell us where this plague came from and what more we should know about its impact. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, sylvatic plague is the primary threat to black and ferrets in the wild today. And just backing up a little bit, historically, we thought there may have been like 500,000 of them in the wild. Wow. And the reason for their decline was with European settlement in the 1800s and early 1900s came the transformation of the prairie. So there were three primary reasons for the decline in ferrets and their prairie dog prey. And that is plow up of the prairie um, from native grasses into row crop agriculture poison. There were large-scale government-sponsored poisoning programs targeted at prairie dogs to increase forage availability Ah, uh, for livestock who had moved into the country. And then finally, just explain that a little more. So the settlers wanted to have enough forage uh, for their livestock to eat. And so they wanted to kill off the, um, the other native species that were also trying to nibble at the same plants? Yeah, there were a lot of competition for resources in some of those days. And then, of course, in the early 1900s, there was this infamous event called the Dust Bowl era. So when you have large series and years of droughts and there is competing needs on the same plot of land, meaning that prairie dogs eat grass, livestock eat grass. Then when people are trying to make a living, um, sometimes wildlife loses. Mm. And there was a gentleman by the name of Seahart Merriam in 1902, who once worked for the U.S. government, uh, which is now the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who declared prairie dogs a pest back in the day. And that led to these large scale government sponsored poisoning programs. And one of the largest challenges that we have today with fair recovery, which is the social tolerance of their prairie dog prey, which renders the lack of habitat availability for black-footed ferrets. And then you couple that with the the incredibly damaging impacts of plague, which is an introduced disease 
um, which came to North America on Asian trading ships hmm. um, where there were rats on those ships with fleas. And so those ships came into the San Francisco Harbor in California in early 1900s. And basically those fleas jump ship and landed in small mammal populations in the Western United States and then moved across the country into South Dakota um, over the years. And because it's a non-native species, species like prairie dogs and blackfoot ferrets have little natural immunity to it and are therefore highly susceptible um, to it. And plague can come as it is now in a couple of places in South Dakota and eliminate uh, not only the prairie dog population in a matter of weeks, but ferrets too. And as you mentioned earlier, these fleas that carry the plague bacterium are the vector. And so fleas will land on a ferret, fleas will land on a prairie dog and they will die. Prairie dogs could also transfer plague from tactile communication between family members. Um, and then ferrets that eat a prairie dog that's infected with plague can die or ferrets yeah. can die from starvation because all the prairie dogs are gone. Thankfully, we have some tools to mitigate plague in both species today. Yeah, and I want to just keep going on that thread and, and stay with you for a, m a minute longer, Christy, to ask you to talk just it, it, in, in the broader sense of, of what we're doing to, uh, to deploy those tools to prevent the, this plague and to save prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets. Yeah, so we typically start um, on an annual basis with protecting both populations of prairie dogs and ferrets. Um, there is an effective once-in-a-lifetime vaccine for black-footed ferrets. It's called an F1V vaccine, which protects them with one shot and a booster for life. And Tevin can talk about that process in a little bit. Um, but we also have tools in which we curtail flea populations to mm. protect prairie dogs. So currently we have um, two tools. One is a dust that is placed down within prairie dog burrows. It coats the inside of a prairie dog burrow so that any fleas traveling into the burrow die on contact from the dust. Hmm. And then as prairie dogs come up through those burrow systems, they also get a little bit of dust coating. So it also removes fleas on them and fosters better health and survival for them by removing those ectoparasites from their body. So that is done on an annual basis. Actually, Tevin Scott Cruz coming out this week to conduct plague mitigation in prairie dog colonies at Fort Belknap. And another tool that we have is called Fipronil grain. So it's a grain laced with Fipronil, which is the same ingredient that many of us use to protect our dogs and cats from fleas and ticks. So this grain is consumed by prairie dogs. And if a flea lands on the prairie dog and gets a blood meal, then the flea then dies. Huh. So those are two highly effective tools we have today. Up and coming, we have some exciting new tools that we're testing. Um, one is called Fit Bits, and those are little peanut butter flavored baits um, that have fipronil in them that we can drop by drone or ATV, all-terrain vehicle, wow. um, across many thousands of acres. And that's a promising new tool for us that would not only reduce the cost of getting plague mitigation out to thousands of acres of prairie dogs at scale where ferrets live, but also efficiently be able to access all of those colonies in a timely fashion. Wow. So that all sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> um, to, to, there's a lot of steps <laughs> happening on different time frames over the course of, of a year. Um, so I, I, the first thing you said was vaccinating the ferrets on an annual basis, right? And Tevin, I know that you are uh, working closely with Christy and you're one of, one of the folks who is boots on the ground, really hands-on doing that work. I'd love for you to paint a picture of what it looks like to actually go out and, and capture the ferrets and vaccinate them and, and return them uh, to the wild. You know, what does an average day look like in the effort to save black-footed ferrets? Yeah, so uh, spotlighting, we have three session, sessions where uh, 10 nights straight, so 30 nights total. And a uh, little preparation is um, we park a hospital trailer where we take the black-footed ferrets and uh, to do the vaccinations and tagging. Mm -hmm. And then so the night of, we'll meet at the hospital trailer around 
10 and then try to start spotlighting by 11 p.m. And then the spotlighting will be until sunrise. So in um, spotlighting, tell us what, what does that mean? You, I, I, you have to use a spotlight to uh, find the ferrets, right? Yeah, so there are truck roof mounted spotlights. Um, hmm. You kind of just scan like a, a 180 degrees in front of yep. you and just you go about uh, five, 10 miles per hour across the Prairie Dog Town. And um, you look for a green eye shine close to the ground. And uh, yeah, you'll just spot the prairie dog burrow that the black foot ferret's in. And then we have traps, which are um, kind of rectangular, long traps. And um, kind of stick, stick into the burrow. And then you have these ring okay. readers there for uh, the tags that we put on the ferrets in previous years. And you kind of just set them up where uh, you put the ring reader and then the trap and on the prairie dog burrow. And then you stick a marker so you know, you know where it's at from a distance. And you also GPS the uh, burrow. And then okay. we also use red solo cups on the neighboring uh, prairie dog burrows. So they'll have to oh, come to up to block them up trap. so that they can't come out the other side. I yeah. See. Interesting. And then uh, you'll kind of just drive around for an uh, hour or two, come back to the trap if it's in there. Uh, you'll take the trap. You'll write down the if the number, the tag that's on the uh, ring reader. If there's none, then it's most likely a wild-born uh, ferret. So, yeah, we all write that down on this um, uh, paper here. And... Uh, Take it back to the hospital trailer where we do uh, vaccinations for the F1. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also vaccinate against uh, canine distemper. And uh, we put pit tags right on the back of the nape of the neck. And um, all while doing this, they are under anesthesia. So there's gotcha. uh, no pain. And then... Uh, you kind of just wait for them to wake up after, you know, that process is done. And after they wake up, you, you take the ferret back to the exact same burrow and then, um, you know, release it. Yeah, and you hope that you can catch it in the next couple of weeks again to give it a booster. Ah, booster. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's twice the work for every ferret. Yeah. But once they're <laughs> vaccinated, they're good for life. So... Um, so if I can just summarize that, uh, it, it's you, you're going out at night, you are driving around. I, how, I, how how much land are you covering it in a given evening? Are we talking about several acres or more? Uh, about fifteen hundred acres. Fifteen hundred acres. So you're going out at night. You're driving around this huge stretch of land looking, uh, shining, shining a spotlight around the top of a truck, 360 degrees, trying to f spot these little uh, reflective eyes um, in the darkness that indicate where yeah. a ferret is hiding. You're going to where you saw those eyes, setting a trap to, uh, at, at the burrow that it, it was hiding in to uh, capture it when it tries to come back out. You're blocking the other holes around that hole with solo cups to prevent the ferret from escaping out the back entrance. And then uh, after a couple hours, you check the traps again. If the ferret has entered the trap, um, then you bring it back to the, the hospital uh, truck and, and sedate it and, and vaccinate it and then wait for it to wake up and release it back into the wild. I know I'm describing that in a way that is like a best case scenario for how this works on a given night. Um, it must be, require a lot of patience and um, and commitment to, to go out and do that uh, night after night after night, right? Yeah, the nights get long. They definitely get long. <laughs> yeah, you know, ideally you're trapping 
lots of ferrets, right? Yeah. You've got a couple of trucks out with other crews and, you know, they're also looking and helping um, to collect ferrets and bring them to Tevin so that he can vaccinate them. And so it's a, it is a complex process and one in which should we be able to find a cure for plague, that wouldn't be needed. But until we do, protecting these individual ferrets, as there are only fewer than 400 in the wild today, and maybe even less as we speak, because plague is active in a couple of sites, it's really imperative that we are being proactive in protecting ferrets at these sites and also the prey dog prey underneath them. Gotcha. And you said you do three rounds of 10 nights at a time uh, over the course yeah. of every year. Is that right? And I imagine that's because you're just trying to catch newborn ferrets as they're uh, as they're coming into the world uh, throughout the course of a year. Yeah, the initial session is more of a kind of a kit survey. Uh, there's no trapping or yeah, no trapping or vaccine. It's uh, more of prepping for the vaccinations, how much we'll need for those next mm -hmm. two sessions. And uh, yeah, those next two sessions are the trapping. Gotcha. Yeah, and so that first that first session too also gives us an estimate of how many ferrets survived over winter, how many litters are out there, and if we can, how many kits are in each litter. And then, as yeah, Tevin mentioned, the trapping surveys or the trapping sessions are to vaccinate and inoculate and place ID tags on those individuals that aren't marked. You know, sometimes we're not catching every wild born in year one, we catch them in year mm -hmm. two. Um, so we're always trying to make sure that we can catch everybody that's out there. Of course, there are some misses. But in addition, the, that information then gets fed up to the Fish and Wildlife Service that says, you know, Fort Belknap has this many total ferrets and this many adults. And those numbers contribute to the overall recovery objectives that are listed in the Fish and Wildlife Service's recovery plan, which are 3,000 breeding adults in 30 or more places in at least nine of the 12 historical range states of the Blackfoot ferret. And then each population in and of itself ideally would have at least 30 adults in it. Mm -hmm. And then some of those populations should have a hundred adults. Wow. So we have a long way to go. So while there are you know, fewer than 400 ferrets in the wild today, only about half of those are adults. So we've got a long way to go. Habitat exists. Awesome people like Tevin leading uh, recovery efforts at their individual sites. Those people exist, um, but we certainly need funding um, to be able to pay to cover that ground and keep staff employed. And we also need to find more places where we can host ferrets. When we're talking about recovery of the species, we're only talking about needing like a less than a percent of what they once occupied to recover the the species. So we only need a million acres from Canada to Mexico of prey dog colonies to be able to recover the species. So it's a small ask, but it's definitely a big lift. Gotcha. Wow. Um, Christy, just one follow on question to what you just said, uh, or, or, or just maybe a point to clarify. Uh, I, I forget if we covered this already, but the, one of the reasons that we need prairie dog habitat is because the ferrets actually live in the burrows that the ferret, the prairie dogs create, right? So we think of those little holes in the ground that the prairie dogs live in. Um, but I, one thing I've learned in, in the course of preparing for this interview is uh, when the prairie dogs create those burrows, they, they sometimes leave and go to another burrow or they may die off or whatever. And there's a lot of empty burrows across the prairie that they leave behind and the ferrets and other species use those as, as habitat and hiding places for themselves too, right? So that's why the whole ecosystem kind of fits together and benefits all of the species in the prairie. Yeah, what's remarkable about the prairie ecosystem is that the presence of prairie dogs enables the presence of 130 or so other wildlife species, as you were just describing. Yeah. We consider prairie dogs like, you know, really the Scooby snacks of the prairie where, <laughs> you know, many species eat them. And then, you know, the rest of the species that don't eat them use their burrows for, for shelter and raising young. So they, prairie dogs, are a keystone species. But their populations are healthiest with predators like like blackfoot ferrets in place. And as a mid-sized predator, they are an important piece of that food chain. 
And so by restoring populations of blackfoot of ferrets, you also help to keep alive this complex network of prairie dogs. And we, we consider this prairie dice, right? Because you have this full complement of all the wildlife species endemic to the prairie um, that have been there for millennia and that have co-evolved, yeah. right? So ferrets are slinky sized shape and they evolved to navigate complex prairie dog burrow systems. Um, and that special specialization of prairie dogs has led to, um, you know, their demise tied to prairie dogs directly. So it's in our best interest in order to recover ferrets. We need to protect that prairie dog ecosystem. But that comes with a wealth of benefits in terms of bringing the prairie alive. And it's very noticeable in the absence of prairie dogs. When a plague event comes through, it's like a ghost town. Hmm. But when prairie dogs are active, you know, Tevin can talk about this too. It's it's alive, right? You've got chirping of prairie dogs, you've got raptors flying over, you've got coyotes and swift fox and badgers trotting through, bison and pronghorn grazing in the background, burrowing owls peeking out of the holes. It's a pretty spectacular ecosystem. Wow. Um, Tevin, I want to ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, I know one of the things we're doing to, to, get more hands uh, involved in the process of identifying and, and vaccinating all these uh, all these animals is involving students from the Ani and Nakoda tribes. And I wanted to just ask you to talk a little bit about the importance of having local leadership and local participation from those tribes in this effort and what it means to the community in Fort Belknap. Uh, yeah, um, I guess being a local leader, especially as like a uh, part of the, the tribes and the community you kind of possess an understanding of uh, tradition and culture and I don't know, relationship with the environment in a way. It also uh, empowers their building capacity and to manage and uh, protect our resources and wildlife. And uh, stewardship, uh, I suppose, kind of develop a, a pride of uh, natural heritage. Yeah. yeah. Um, Christy, last question to you. You know, we talk a lot on this show about the connection between saving a species and saving an ecosystem. And I know there's a really similar cl connection with black-footed ferrets and the prairies of the northern Great Plains. Tell us, if, if you and your colleagues are successful... Uh, if you and Tevin go out and do all the things that you can and need to do to to uh, to accomplish your mission, what does the future look like for black-footed ferrets and for their prairie home? Well, hopefully it equates to delisting from the endangered species list, mm. removal completely. If I live long enough and we are successful, we... I would love to see that day. And hopefully that means we're both out of jobs and we could do something different. <laughs> but um, it, it definitely means that we have restored the ecosystem to its fullest extent of the way it once was. And of course, we can't go back to the levels and the extent and abundance of prey dogs and ferrets. However, bringing that complement of predator prey cycle back does balance the prairie and it keeps everything full. I think the challenge is that until we can address how we can stop sylvatic plague from impacting these species, we are here for the long haul. Yeah. Ferrets are considered a conservation reliant species at this point in time. And while there are really exciting efforts to curtail plague in a genetic way, you know, can we genetically modify fleas to not spread plague? You know, that's probably years and years and years away. So in the short term, we need a lot of places and people like Tevin across North America investing in this species and this recovery, because without it, we are seeing ecosystem collapse. If you add all the variables that go into maintaining habitats in the face of climate change today, um, those everything is getting scaled up. So droughts and floods are, are much more intense. The weather is much more intense. And that all has impacts on wildlife dependent on the Great Plains for survival. And that also impacts our connection and survival as human 
this ecosystem is not only you know, considered the American Serengeti, it's also the bread and butter basket of North America. And so mm-hmm. if we aren't protecting the water, the soil, the plants, the wildlife and the people, do we really have a future, right? So our work here, while localized, um, but spread across the Great Plains is really critical. And if we can restore even these 3,000 to 5,000 to 10,000 acres of prairie dog ecosystem in 30 or more places, then recovery of this endangered species is possible. And also our connection with this landscape and the animals that call it home. Yeah. Well, very well said, Christy, and thank you so much for taking the time to teach us about black-footed ferrets today. Thank you, Tevin, also for sharing your experiences in this work. I'm really grateful to both of you for your time and for all the hard work you're doing every day. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Christy and Tevin for joining the show today. I loved learning about the masked bandit of the prairie, and I hope you did too. Black-footed ferrets may not be the most well-known endangered species, but they have an important role to play in our North American web of life, and I'm grateful to know that Christy, Tevin, and their colleagues are working so hard to save them. Thanks for listening, and together, let's keep building a more sustainable future.